All right. How's everyone doing? Still in at your left, all caffeinated? Um, so, let's get started here. So first of all, thank you so much for having me. It's kind of my second time here in Romania, and it's always a pleasure to be back. So, I'm Kenneth. Um, I'm born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark. That's why there's a bit of a Danglish accent going on. I cannot get rid of it. And I'm currently based in Seattle, Washington, so all the way over on the, on the West Coast. So there's a bit of jet lag going on here. Um, for the past many years, I spent a lot of time building developer tools. Uh, I've been involved with Chrome Dev Tools, Edge Dev Tools, and W3C, working on what we today call uh, the Dev Tools Protocol that's powering Puppeteer and a few other things. Uh, I'm involved with, w, uh, with the World Economic Forum as one of the global shapers. Um, at the WEF, I'm mainly spending my time thinking about things like climate change and automation. Um, as I referred before, uh, I used to be a PM on the Visual Studio Code team, responsible for our JavaScript experience and our JavaScript debugging experience. Um, and just a few months ago, I joined a new mission. I joined Stripe. So at Stripe, I, I'm now leading a team where we are looking after our developer tooling story for the economic infrastructure of the internet. But really, what I'm here to talk about today is, uh, is DevTools for the next decade. I know it's a bit of a futuristic title, um, so what I really want to talk about today is some of the observations I made in the developer tooling landscape and try to apply those to the world of JavaScript and front end. Because, hey, we're here at Revo.js. But uh, a good reminder this morning, I just saw this tweet, so I had to include it. It's actually a pretty good reminder that there's 90 days left of this decade. So this kind of made my job a bit easier. Like I only have to think beyond 90 days and then we're all good, right? Um, no, really, uh, this talk is about uh, what could be happening in the next 10 years. So I just, before I get started, I just want to do a disclaimer. This is my personal opinion, and it doesn't necessarily reflect some of the organizations I'm affiliated with. I just want to get that out of the door so we don't have any like tweets or photos or stuff like that taken out of context. So this is about the future, and as illustrated on, on this slide here with a crystal ball, uh, before we can predict the future, we have to look into the crystal ball. But I actually think uh, we have to take a step back. As the Chinese philosopher Confucius said, you have to study the past if you want to defi define the future. So I think it's pretty profound for us that we need to take a step back and say, what has actually happened in the past decades in our industry when we think about computer science and programming? And I think there's a few paradigms that has kind of defined uh, a lot for us. So the first thing is the way we think about computing power. We've kind of gone from a world with local compute, where compute was this scarce resource all of us developers was fighting for, to now we live in a world with cloud computing. And all of us in this room have probably access to, to a cloud environment. And today, we don't think about c c compute uh, being, being a thing that, that is hard to get. If we need a new server, we can probably spin it up as long as we have the, the, the money to pay for the bills. So compute is no longer a problem for a lot of engineers. And this has a profound impact on the way we think about software and some of the solutions we're building. We just scale up more servers, right? The next thing that has happened uh, in our industry is the programming abstractions. Over and over again, we have kind of gone from this paradigm where we've gone from like low-level abstractions to more high-level abstractions. We've gone from low-level assembly and binary and machine code to more high-level abstractions like Python. Here I've illustrated this with, with, with Jupyter, uh, which you kind of use for data science. And the interesting thing, if you look at our, our industry, every time we have made, uh, we have made a, a transition in abstraction, we've ended up in this somewhat religious war in our industry, claiming that this newer high-level abstraction it's not programming, because we have the, the older generation that knows machine code. They don't think the C thing is, is, is actually programming. And this happens over and over again. But the interesting thing is that we, every time we embrace a new, more high-level abstraction, we have a generation of developers growing up that don't know how the underlying abstractions work. And probably as most of us in this room, we really don't know assembly code or binary code. And isn't that okay? I think that's pretty interesting that we kind of end up in this battle all the time. The other thing that has happened, and that's something I've been working on, is our developer tools. We have kind of gone from somewhat basic text editors that was really built for documents to these more like highly optimized environments like Visual Studio Code. Or take any text editor, even take Vim. You have code completion. You have like tools inside the environment that makes you more productive as a developer. And we have kind of refined these experiences over the years. That's a big shift. That we kind of made specialized tools for our, our developers. 
And the other thing that has happened, if you think about our industry, is that software engineering, in, in engineering has actually become an industry. We have specialized roles because we cannot do everything anymore. And like I, I just tried to outline the scale here. Today could be that you do some ML stuff. You do hardcore computer science. Maybe you do data science. Maybe you're working with data sets. Maybe you do back end. Maybe you do full stack. And here, the, probably a lot of us does full stack on front end. But basically, the world has become specialized. In, software engineering has become a spectrum. And then there's the other thing is that we've kind of embraced this notion that software is eating the world. Software is finding its way to every single industry, and that's the, the massive opportunity for us as software engineers, which is a pretty profound change when we think about accounting, we think about real estate, software is dominating and changing those industries. So the question I've been asking myself is what has happened to BIP development? Because hey, most of us are actually building for the web platform. And I think the first thing that has happened, which was just highlighted, uh, but by the previous talk about uh, VASM, is that the VIP platform has become an application runtime. We no longer build simple scientific re reports showed in document reader, but we build applications. And the example I'm showing every time is Netflix. Think of it, you go to Netflix and you stream HD video directly in your browser, and millions of people are doing this every hour. It's an application running inside an application runtime. The other thing that has happened Again, same thing that is happening across our industries. So we have moved to higher level authoring abstractions. But what I mean by that is that most of us are probably living inside some sort of framework. We use a more productive authoring abstraction that is different than the platform. And we can like, look at all the abstractions we use today, whether it's Vue.js, React, maybe in your CSS, you use CSS module style components, maybe you use TypeScript that is a more productive authoring abstraction. Or maybe you use like Bitpack because you want to like you don't want to think about the low-level primitives of doing your bundling and, and all, all that stuff. This is a pre pretty profound change: application runtime and higher-level abstractions. The other thing that has happened for the web platform is that we, we tend to we have embraced this, this mental model of components. We no longer write a, a lot of CSS uh, and HTML by hand, but we think about components because it's a more productive abstraction for us to work in. And then there's the notion here, which I think was pretty interesting, and he finished the, the, the talk, is that the BIP platform has become a compile target. And that's really uh, emphasized that us using these high-level abstractions, if you use, use React, you compile to the web platform. If you use TypeScript, you compile to the web platform. And this is emphasized by WebAssembly, assembly script. You can take your Rust code today, compile it with VASM, and you can run it as a, as a module in your browser. If you write a game in Unity, or you, if you probably write a game, you probably use some sort of authoring abstraction there, like Unity. You just compile it for the web. Maybe it's using WebGL below the surface, maybe it's using something else, but you just compile it to the platform. And there's MScript that is enabling any LLVM based language like C, C to run in the browser. You just compile. And then I think because of these shifts that have happened, I think right now what, what is happening is that we are witnessing a generational debate on what VIP development is all about. What I mean by that is that we see articles like this. The differing perspectives of, for example, CSS and JavaScript. And you think about the notion and the framework of a, of a low level and a high level abstraction, I think we can, we can apply the same thing here. Is this because we are going from a mental model where we write CSS and HTML by hand, that's our low level abstraction? And now we as developers are embracing a more productive high-level abstraction. I think there's a lot of similarity here if you think about low-level assembly and high-level uh, high Python. And I think what's happening here is the same thing we have been doing in our industry over and over again, that every time we embrace a new abstraction level, we have a debate because a lot of people spend a lot of time learning one particular abstraction level. It's interesting. So. Now we kind of established a few observations on where we're kind of coming from. I think now is the time to really look into the crystal ball and talk about what's next. And the first thing when I look into the crystal ball is, uh, is basically automation. What we hear is that the future is automated, but what does that really mean for all our jobs? I think we see that in the news articles, we see it everywhere. What we also see is that automation will probably change the world of work, probably do something better. But the interesting framing about the whole automation conversation is that we tend to think automation 
about manufacturing. You think about the factory worker, like, I, like I've illustrated here. You think about that person that is producing something in a factory. And the next thing we think about automation is that we think about robots. It's kind of the same way that we're producing cars. It's a robot welding the cars together. But the question I'm super curious about is that what will happen to us as software engineers? What will happen to, the, to us sitting in VS Code or any other future editor coding? There we go. Okay. So, um, and the, the typical notion when we talk about automation is that we talk about the notion that, hey, the future's work is going to be auto automated with AI, and the robots will just come and take our jobs, right? That's kind of the scary scenario. That's also the, the, the mental model we, we have, like, for, for the factory worker. And I think we really have to, like, go back to the notion about software is eating the world. The software is, is finding its way into manufacturing halls, it's all the industries, software is everywhere. So the question I've kind of been asking myself is, what is happening to software? So think about this. This is a great article by, by Pete Warden uh, on Google's TensorFlow team. Deep learning is eating software. So think about this for, for a moment. Software is eating the world, and now deep learning is eating software. So what does that really mean? And like, now we're kind of entering meme territory because we are all software engineers. All of us, can we just say, hey, let's just automate this. We can describe it, we can build it. So I spent a lot of time reading a lot of reports about like, hey, what does the future bring? And I found this really I I interesting report from, from McKinsey back from 2018 or 17. Um, and they did like this super interesting breakdown of different roles uh, um, and trying to identify the potential in automation. Let me just highlight the interesting bit here. The interesting bit here is that for VIP developers, 62% of the work that VIP developers are doing that there's a 30% opportunity. We can automate a third of VIP developers' work for 62 of all VIP developers. That's what they identify. To me, that's super interesting, that there's a massive opportunity on automating a third of the work. So you cannot lose the job, right, if we're the one automating ourselves, which is kind of the typical engineering fallacy. So, I kind of been asking myself, where do we find those 30% and what's kind of already happening to our developer tools? So I want to talk about a few trends that is happening in our industry. The first thing we are seeing is that our developer tools are moving to the web, or you can say the cloud. And that's happening with like environments like Code Sandbox, Stack, Stack Blitz, yeah, Repolit, even VS Code. It's going to be in some sort of cloud environment. You go to a URL, maybe there's some services added on top. And I, I want to elaborate why this is happening, that our environments are moving to the cloud. The next thing we are seeing is that our coding environments are now getting the notion of real-time collaboration, much similar to what happened with Google Docs and Word, that we needed collaboration because we were at different places to write some remote work. That is happening to our developer tools too, because people are not sitting in the same offices anymore. And the reason for why our developer tools are moving to the cloud is because our development boxes are moving to the cloud too. And this is really triggered by the whole notion that in a similar way that our applications went from local boxes to cloud computers because we needed to scale, we're now reaching a point in time where our, our development environments also need to scale, especially if you're building a machine learning workloads, that kind of stuff, because you simply don't have enough memory on your local machine. So it's all kind of going hand in hand. And we're already seeing like big companies like Microsoft, Google, even at Stripe, our development boxes are running in the cloud. Code is no longer running on our machines. And then there's the next wave we're seeing is basically AI-assisted developer tools. So this is a screenshot of intelligence inside VS Code. And what you see here at the top is that there's a few methods, uh, and I'm losing my microphone here, and um, there's a few uh, methods that has been stopped. You still hear me? All right, I think we're good. All right, um, and w what's going on here is basically is Visual Studio IntelliCode that is a, a machine learn powered uh, tool that is running inside your editor. What Microsoft has done here is that they have indexed all uh, uh, open source source code on GitHub and produced a model. So when you are inside a particular scope in your JavaScript function, VS Code knows exactly 
what is the most common scenario for this particular line in this particular scope. This is already AI that is available inside your editor. And Microsoft is not alone with this. We're seeing other tools doing it for Java. We're seeing Kite doing it for Python. It's happening across the industry. The other thing we're seeing is that we're seeing tools like this that is doing AI automated code reviews. So this is bots that are leaving comments on your code. It's not humans, which is super interesting. It's fascinating. And the other thing that we're also seeing with tools like DiffBlue for Java developers is that DiffBlue is actually writing the unit tests for you. It's just scaffolding everything and saying, here, maybe you can use this as a starting point. We are already seeing AI making its way into our development workflow. It's fascinating. Then we're also seeing another thing is that bots are automating our workflows. I think all of us probably have like a dependency bot on GitHub that is analyzing our dependencies, opening a PR for some things. And we are seeing like GitHub further accelerating this with GitHub Actions. Just another abstraction to make it easier to build automation. And I just found this tweet the other day and like just this just happened. A bot found a vulnerability in a dependency. A bot sent a PR to fix it. The CI verified the PR. A bot merged it. And a bot celebrated the merge with a GIF. Just think about that. This is, now we are talking about the 30% potential in automating the work that we are doing every day. This is like all machines coding for us. And we just read it and say, hey, it looks good, right? It's impressive, but it's already happening. And the other thing that we see in our industry is the rise of what we now call no-code and low-code. We're seeing a generation of developer tools being built that is enabling non-technical people to build software. We're seeing that with tools like Retool, that is a platform to build internal tools for companies. Instead of you putting together something in Bootstrap, you just use Retool. We're seeing Bubble, we're seeing Webflow for HTML and CSS. We, you can even argue that Airtable and tools like Sapiens is automating a lot of, like, the, the work that a lot of engineers would be doing. This is happening. And this is not a new thing. Like, I'm, I'm old enough to, to remember Yahoo Pipes. There was a visual tool, a no-code tool, and how I could manipulate with my RSS feed. But the key thing here is that now we are seeing tools like Glide. You can just go glideapps.com, and then you build a PWA. You build it right in, in, in your editor, and that is probably replacing a lot of engineers. Because now the business person can just do the prototype of that internal tool. It's already happening. And the key thing here is that low-code and no-code tools and platforms are enabling a new generation of people to build software. And it's incredible. It's enabling many more people, not just us in this room, because we have happened to study computer science. It's super, super interesting. But what is happening to software engineering itself? That's kind of the question I've been asking myself. And I think it's, it's pretty interesting that the first thing that is happening is that we're starting to treat code as data. And I think this was pretty, uh, this was a pretty good example from GitHub last week where they announced the code search net challenge. Where GitHub has basically been indexing and building a data set on a lot, millions of lines of code on GitHub, packaged it up as a data set, and now they want data scientists to start building models and training AIs on top of this. Similar to how we have data sets for images and a lot of things, now we're doing the exact same thing and this is really fueled by what's now known as Software 2 or has been popularized by the notion of Software 2. So this is a pretty, pretty, pretty popular blog post by Andre uh, from, uh, from Tesla. And I think uh, the, the way he's introducing things uh, is, is a pretty profound way to think about like, what is actually happening right in front of our eyes. Neural nets, networks are not just another classifier. They represent the beginning of a fundamental shift in how we write software. They're Software 2.0. What, what does this mean that, hey, I'm training an ML, uh, and then what is this software 2.0 thing about? And I think if you go back to Pete Warden from Google's TensorFlow team, I think he's describing it pretty well. Instead of writing and maintaining integrated layered tangles of logic, the developer has to become a teacher, a curator of training data, and an analyst of the results. This is very, very different than the programming I was taught in school. What's, get, 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 uh, what's getting most excited is that it should be far more accessible than traditional coding once the tooling catches up. And I think that's the key thing. And what's really happening here is if you think about this in level of abstractions, we can think about traditional programming as rewriting the rules, 
pulling in the data, and then we get some answers out. But now we're kind of t uh, twisting the test-driven uh, development model on its head. Now we give it the data, we give it the answers, and then we get the rules out. We get the logic that we used to write. That's the profound change with software 2.0. And we can think about this in level of abstractions, that now we're kind of going from a software 1.0 abstraction level, where we're writing explicit instructions in Python, to a world with software 2.0, where we really talk about data sets, models, and weights. It's a profound change that might be the future. I don't know, but it's interesting. And we are already seeing examples like this every single week. Google DeepMind optimizing the cooling bills by 40%. We are seeing a lot of these things because what's happening here is that machines in some areas are better than us in writing the logic, figuring it out. So the question, again, I'm asking myself, like, what will software 2.0 mean for editors and developer tools you're using every day? What does this really mean? So, Let's see if it's loading. I have a backup. Oh, we good? Nope, buffering. Have image. Run a CLI tool. It's using a model. We're generating something here based on this model. This is real time. This is like just crunching using your CPU. What do we have here? We have a storyboard with all the UI components. That's pretty interesting. I can edit things. That's kind of the mobile scenario, and I just want a storyboard, right? So now we have another example. This is, you know, it's a typical dashboard what I'm building with Bootstrap. And the same tool, now I say target the web. Model is doing its job. It's a hard work, right? Think about this, this is real time. This is the work that you usually do by hand. So now we have a HTML file. Open it in Firefox. We have our HTML code and CSS. This is research from two years ago that USAT did. And the interesting thing, two years later, they funded startup that actually has a product you can use. And the question I'm asking myself, where will this stuff be in 10 years? And that leads me to the notion of hand coding. All of us are writing our code by hand today, talk about the AI scenarios that's already helping us. And the question I've been asking myself is that, will we think about hand coding as the same way we think about traditional craft? We think about craftsmanship, think about like a person in a workshop, sitting there with the tools fiddling. But will we, will we think about hand coding in the same way? Or maybe in 10 years from now, we will think about the same way we think about robots in a manufacturing hall. That maybe hand coding will be this luxury thing that is super expensive, because the vast majority of code is written by machines. This is a question I'm starting asking myself. And it's, it's pretty profound. And also, like, we think about like, what is the future of code editors? If, code, if coding is really about like you building a data set and you need to manipulate this data set, it's no longer writing the specific code because it might be a bit assembly, then maybe code editors is something like TensorFlow, 
uh, that Google is doing where you can inspect what's going on inside the model. Uh, maybe maybe uh, something like this that is from Loeb AI, that's a startup by Mark Matas that was acquired by Microsoft. That you just drag in a folder of images, and now in real time you're seeing the neural network taking your input from the webcam or running the emoji uh, detector based on the input. Maybe that's how we will be debugging neural networks as software too in, in the future. I don't know, but this is pretty interesting stuff that we need to figure out over the next decade. Step debugging, I don't know how it works. And also, like, what is the future of GitHub? In a world where you could argue that probably we have a lot of data and a lot of data sets, what is GitHub? Is this why GitHub is introducing the code search and its challenge to try to figure these things out? What is a repository? What is a commit? We don't know yet. And this kind of leads me to, to, to the last bit of my talk here, is that I really think the next decade is going to be focused around developer productivity and the role that developers play. So at Stripe, back in September last year, we did this report where we went out and asked thousands of companies, the engineering leads, CTOs, we asked them how the engineers are spending their time. And what we found in this study is that 17 hours, that's the average time spent by developers working on legacy systems and bad code every week. That's pretty profound. And when we break it down, what we realized here and what we was told by all these companies is that developers spend on average 42% of their time every week on maintenance. Whether it's technical debt, this is directly like bad code. And that's out of a work week of 41 one hours. And the interesting thing when we think about the impact of this is that we summarize it because, hey, we're a financial company, we think about opportunity. It's a $3 trillion opportunity over the next decade for us to make developers more productive, make all of us in this room productive. And I think that's where software 2.0 and automation is going to be a play. It won't replace us. It will make us more productive so we can start tapping into some of this. It's a lot of money. And the question here is got, that is going to be in focus is that how can we enable developers to focus on the highest leverage work? How can we, instead of doing the merging on GitHub and reviewing code, how can we focus on actually solving business problems? Because frankly, that's why we are here. And I really think that that's kind of what's the next decade for developer tools will be all about. How can we make engineering more productive? And the question I want to leave all of you with today is that if you think about software engineering as a spectrum, what kind of role are you specialized in today? And where will you be in a decade from now? I don't know if this spectrum is right, but it could sure be that some of us are going to live in more high-level abstractions instead of writing HTML and CSS. Maybe the future is that you sit in a, in a low-code, no-code environment. I think a pretty good example was the chatbot talk we saw yesterday, where he, he ended up coding a chatbot in a JSON schema. There was no code involved. And that's a pretty good example of a low-code abstraction. If you're just programming a chatbot, you're no longer writing the specific code, because that's a model that's running behind the scenes. So maybe we all need to re rethink the way uh, we specialize, at least after looking at all these observations, I've started asking myself what I'm specialized in and whether that is going to be relevant for the future. Thank you.